Uh, we'll start the first lecture in um, block E uh, about trade, aid, uh, international aid, and uh, foreign investment. Um, as you see, today we'll talk mainly about international trade. So the ranking seems to be a bit higher this time. It's five, so you rank it an average five. But I don't want to overestimate the ranking because only um, it's out of eight responses. So there were many, mo many more who um, give their feedback through Socrative, but they didn't rank the lecture. First, so as usual, we start with um, a recap of what we have, uh, what we did last uh, last week. Uh, we discussed the human capital and how it contributes to um, uh, development and growth. Uh, first, we wanted to define what we mean by human capital. It's all anything related to people's uh, health, education, uh, skills, knowledge, experience, even habits. So ever, every anything that has to do with the quality of the workforce or the quality or the well-being of people, so that's something related to uh, human capital. Uh, individuals themselves, they invest in, um, in themselves, they invest in, in their human capital because they want to improve their uh, personal economic returns. So you go to university because you think about your job prospects, etc., and how much you will earn or the returns to this education. So, and that is the, uh, uh, something important for all individuals. Also, governments should invest in human capital, so they do, but uh, in general, we raised the point, we discussed the point that, even we did this in the seminar today as well, that governments uh, seem to be less interested in investing uh, in human capital, and we discuss why in the tutorial today. Um, we also um, discussed the human capital index, um, which uh, was launched by the uh, World Bank, uh, last October, so a few months ago. Um, and it's an index from zero to one, ranked all countries. Uh, we have about more than 157 countries in, in this index. And, and try to, so the higher the rank, that means the, the, the better or higher level of uh, human capital. Um, as you see, human capital is related to health, education, uh, uh, skills, knowledge, experience, habits, but we focus only on education. And as I said in the lecture last time, this is only one aspect of human, a uh, human capital, which we focused on. And we explained that the literature in human capital used to uh, proxy for uh, human capital using school enrollment. Okay. And we explained why schooling doesn't necessarily mean learning. So it's more important to focus on learning, not just enrollment. Okay. Uh, we also explain the uh, index that is proposed by the again is constructed by the uh, World Bank, the Harmonized Learning Outcome (HLO), and we explain how they constructed an exchange rate, learning exchange rate, to to uh, construct this index. Okay. Um, at the end, we, we made some, some comparisons. We saw that how Singapore, for example, comes uh, at the top of the list uh, according to the HLO. So we, we were concerned more about the scores of the test that the, the children uh, did. And I think they were mainly focusing on uh, reading and math, mathematics. Uh, we, we made some comparisons. It was very interesting to see many countries that uh, uh, outperform large countries like the US. So Singapore came before, I think the US, if I remember, was number 14 in the list in terms of the um, uh, where they are in ranking on the list. Okay, they were number 14, so 13 countries come before the, uh, before the US. We also highlighted the flip, the gender gap in terms of um, enrollment, again, is uh, uh, compared with learning. So we compared we, we talked about boys and girls and, and and usually when we talk about enrollment there's some a negative uh, gap uh, compared to uh, when you compare girls with with boys but those who attend they um, in terms of learning they they it seems that girls outperform uh, or perform better in 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 this in this score more than more than boys. Um, and finally we highlighted the link between learning. You see now we're not talking about enrollment, we're talking about learning. 
and and economic growth and we said that it's it's um, there's a stronger or a higher correlation between learning and growth when we show some statistics last time uh, we also discuss what uh, the report suggests or uh, a term that they coined they call sweet spot uh, based on the regression results which show that investment in human capital is more is most associated with growth as countries move from uh, the bottom to upper end uh, of middle income status so if you remember the last slide in the in the previous lecture we had uh, a table from uh, regression uh, regression table that show and and, and split countries by uh, based on their income and we show that investment is uh, investment in human capital uh, the the magnitude of the coefficient was mass, uh, was the largest with uh, upper middle income countries so what does this suggest? Uh, it suggests actually that human capital is necessary but is not sufficient condition for growth. So we need also to think of institutions and other factors that are important for growth as well. So, so for the whole lecture, we try to highlight the importance of, uh, of human capital uh, for growth. But then at the end, we, we saw that human capital by itself is not enough. We still, it is important, yes, but it's not it's not sufficient condition for uh, for growth. So this is pretty much everything we discussed in the previous lecture. Any question about the previous uh, about the last lecture? Okay. Um, anyway, so now it's time to go on Socrative. So the uh, block E is more about uh, trade aid, as I said, and um, investment, foreign investment. Uh, today we'll focus mainly on trade, but next lecture we'll talk about international aid, the motivation, its impact and outcome, and any debates related to international aid. And the, the, the <coughs> next lecture or the lecture after that, we'll talk about foreign direct uh, investment. So as you see, we have three lectures on this block. And we start today with the first one, international trade and, and development. So just to motivate the discussion, I start with uh, a broader topic which is globalization I'll see how it is linked to uh, what I'm trying to talk about today trade and development uh, but before I start I'm I'm really interested to uh, know what you think about what globalization is so what is meant by globalization and whether you think international trade um, enhance economic development or support economic development and growth of course and why that's why we're gonna say to what we're gonna talk about today we start with globalization <coughs> as uh, as a term globalization um, is a process that um, enable economies um, to become more integrated into uh, the world economy become more interdependent interconnected uh, through different uh, different links even some could think of globalization as emerging global culture where people uh, consume similar goods uh, listen to similar songs and watch similar movies or even the same movies so uh, even for businesses uh, use common languages uh, language like English etc but for us in economics we think of globalization as openness so increased openness of economies to trade financial uh, flows and foreign direct uh, direct investment okay so which is again as I said we might not uh, have a, a formal definition that everyone is happy with uh, of globalization but at least we know what we're talking about because we experience it ourselves okay so if you look at any product you have it's very difficult to, to see that, or it's not very difficult to see that these products or these goods that we consume today come from all over the world. So you could be using your mobile phone to order something coming from China or coming from another country. So that's openness, that's what we talk about. Okay, and that's what we mean by globalization. So uh, looking at the history, so we, we have uh, two waves of globalization. Um, so if you look at this graph, I don't know if how clear that is, hopefully it is clear enough, but if you look before 19th century, this is the level of international trade, so very low level of international trade, and that was until the 19th uh, century. And then the first wave of international trade 
started, you see this is from um, 1500 till 2014. So till 1800 was very low level of, of trade, international trade. The first wave, which is the green line, this one, this starts from the 19th century up to the First World War, 1914. And then this decline happened between uh, the two wars, the first between the First uh, World War and the Second World War. And then after the Second World War, this line, so this one, okay? So it shows you how this is the level of international trade. And this is as a percentage of global GDP, okay? So before the first wave of globalization, international trade was even below 10% of global GDP from this graph here. So it's never became uh, more than 10%. So I think maximum was 9.5%. The first wave you see around 20, 30%, but the world we live in today, international trade is even like more like up to 60% of global GDP. Okay, so it's, it's very, very important. And you see how steep that line is, it's just going upward. Okay, that explains to you, again, this is the second uh, wave of globalization, which we, uh, again, we talk about globalization means openness of economies to trade and, uh, and financial flows, etc. but we focus now in, uh, on trade. Okay, so if we look at before this, these waves started, so trade mainly before that was driven uh, by uh, colonialism, and this represents like flows of goods between uh, empires and colonies, and these are uh, a few uh, countries here, but all of this was really below, uh, as I said, was less than 10% of the global GDP. Of course, if we compare this with um, the first wave, in the first wave, mainly this was uh, by Europe. So this blue one is trade uh, within Europe. So uh, from Western Europe to Western Europe. So this is the, the blue one. If you, if, you, if you look at this, this is marked by the, um, this is like the Second World War. So this is after the Second World War. But before that, which is the first, the first wave we talk about is mainly was increasing from 19, this is 1827 up to the 20th century, uh, 1914, before it declines here. So, but if you look at the composition of this, you'll see that the blue area here, which is the trade from Western Europe to Western Europe, so within Europe, was the biggest share. And of course, after that, it increased again. But here, that was something very, uh, very remarkable. So you can see how, uh, where, uh, where that come from. It's mainly trade within, uh, within Europe. The second wave of globalization, why we see this steep uh, upward trend line is because of uh, the advancement in technologies and mainly reduction in, in transaction costs. So this explains what you see here is the decline of transport and communication costs. That's compared to 1930, okay? So the graph is trying to show you or to explain this upward, very steep upward uh, trend of international trade during the second phase, which we are currently witnessing now. So starting from uh, uh, the second, after the second world war, 19, uh, we're talking from 1945 uh, till, till today, you see the, um, the size or the, the, the magnitude of, of international trade is, 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 is growing, is, is going upward here, and it reached like about 58.28% of the global, G uh, global GDP. <coughs> so what explained this, so partly, as I said, is, uh, is more about the reduction, what happened in the decline in, in, uh, of transport and communication costs. And what we see here is comparing this cost with how it was in 1930. So this was 100%, that means 1930. So after that, 
you see, for example, this is um, this is uh, passenger air transport cost compared to the red line compared to 1930. Look at the blue line, international calls, the cost of international calls, how it dropped significantly compared to uh, 1930. Okay, so again, so this is one of the reasons or one of the explanations why we um, we see this in the second wave of globalization. So it's very understandable, like you can see it now, it's very clear now why uh, uh, we uh, see this. Um, this is this chart show, uh, show you the um, estimates of the value of export to GDP um, for different countries. Few countries here, we have the United States, the blue line, Brazil is the um, red line, United Kingdom is the green line, and China. Look at China. So how important exports or trade in general to China. So this is like exports to GDP ratio. So China, even up to 1980, trade wasn't a very important part in, uh, uh, didn't have a big contribution to the um, Chinese economy. But then since 1980, see this line up to here? So it's gone up. So that explains how important international trade to the Chinese economy. If you compare this with the US, so for example, so the US is a little bit low, so it's below that line, so it's less important, it is less important to the, the US compared to the um, to uh, China. So it's only 9.34% in, in the US. Um, Look at Brazil, well, it was more important before in the past, this time, but then now it became a little bit less important, relatively less important compared to, to the past. But anyway, so the more, I would say that the, the, the larger, if the, if the contribution, having a larger contribution of trade uh, to your GDP, that means you are more integrated into the world economy, more connected to the world economy, more dependent in the world economy, okay? And, and we'll see what that means. So if we have a measure of trade openness, okay? And we try to plot a map of how open or less open countries are. So this measure is uh, trade to GDP ratio. And when I talk about trade, it's uh, exports plus imports, okay? So export plus imports divided by the GDP. This will give us an idea about how integrated or how open countries are into the, uh, into the world economy, okay? So what we see here is the world map with uh, different countries. Um, darker colors means these countries uh, have higher uh, trade to GDP ratio. Okay, so that means international trade is more important. Their economies are dependent on international trade. What does this tell us? What can you see here? What do you see here? What, 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 what does this tell us? <coughs> so where's the US? The US economy is not that dependent on international trade, but compare that to with African economies. You see where the dark blues are, okay? So again, it's a measure that can tell us how integrated countries are into the world economy. This integration will open door to opportunities, but also will expose you to risks, okay? So because you, 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 you mainly your economy is dependent on what is happening, what's going on in the world economy. Okay, so when you look at African countries here, most African countries you see blue, dark blue in some uh, cases. Okay, that means they're more integrated, they're more, more dependent on the world economy, especially international, uh, international trade. So this, this was 2016, by the way, so that was two years ago. Okay. Okay, so... This is what, happeni what is happening now. And well, what's happening now, it's very, really interesting because if we look at the um, world GDP and we try to see the world GDP growth, 
and try to see the contribution of different countries to the world GDP growth, you will see this, this graph shows up to 2017, from 2010 to 2017, it shows like a different fabric of the world economy, where the importance of developing countries become even more important, okay? It all becomes from the importance of trade and their contribution to international trade. So going back here, so this graph shows us that this is the uh, world GDP, okay? And the dark blue is the contribution of uh, rich economies or advanced economies to world growth, okay? So this is the, the, bl the, the dark blue one. If you look at this in the middle, lighter blue one, this is the contribution of only four countries, BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, and China. The contribution of four countries is much larger than the contribution of rich economies. Again, that gives you an idea about the importance of international trade and the important uh, role that developing countries today play in the world economy. So they become more integrated, they become more important in the world economy. Okay, so the, the other car is the other emerging markets uh, apart from these four, uh, four countries. So we have different, different structure today where or different fabric, different architecture of the world economy where there's a higher importance of uh, um, international trade and the contribution of developing countries in, in the world economy. So this break it down further, they show you this 2017 and the contribution to GDP growth. It just uh, compare um, uh, China, for example, the yellow one. So this is the contribution of China, see how big it is. Um, the blue one, advanced economies together. So China has higher contribution. And these are commodity exporters, the gray one. And the green one is the non-commodity exporters, excluding uh, the big countries, China, India, and, and Brazil. So what is, the, what is the main message here? Again, is the, the importance of trade and the importance of how important trade for developing countries, okay? So China, India, Brazil, these emerging economies, plus also other uh, African economies, because this map shows you how dependent uh, these economies are on uh, international trade. How open they are, how much be they became integrated into uh, the world economy. This shows us, show us the growth rate. On the left side, we have the growth rate in advanced economies, and on the right-hand side, we have emerging economies and developing countries. So on average here, you see the advanced economies, they grow about around 2%, less than 2%. And on the other side, emerging economies and developing economies, they grow around 5%. So the growth rate in emerging economies and developing economies tend to be higher uh, uh, than uh, uh, the growth rate in advanced economies. And again, this is, uh, has to do with, with trade, how has to do with how much they became more integrated into the world economy. So the contribution or the drivers of this growth, these are the IMF estimations, and these are 20, uh, 2018, April 2018. The drivers of this growth, what you saw here, this high growth rate, so five, six percent, this is a really, this is incredible growth rate, okay? So this is not a small, uh, small growth rate, okay? And I said this once before in one of the tutorials that even during hard times, even during difficult times, during the global financial crisis, when advanced economies were, uh, uh, didn't uh, grow or didn't achieve like point something or even some negative uh, scores, China was doing really, really well. So they were doing, or many economies, many developing economies were, were doing much better, let's say, than uh, uh, advanced economies. 
So the IMF estimated this, that the um, driver of growth are mainly two factors, uh, industrial production, which is the blue line, but what we are interested in today is world trade uh, volumes. So it seems that trade, even the, the contribution of trade, even more important than the industrial production. So if there are two drivers of this growth that you saw here, that you see here, these are two the fact that these are the two factors that drive this growth. So mainly here is international trade. So trade volumes uh, drive growth in the world economy. So if we just focus or zoom in, and the recent period here from 1960 till uh, 20, I think 2018 or 20, no, 20, don't remember. It's probably 2017, okay? So you see, this is world trade. So again, upward trend, which is confirm what we already saw here, this trend. So it's already, it is consistent with this trend. So just want to zoom in um, to see the recent uh, uh, decades. So again, all what we're saying here is that trade is important and developing countries become more integrated and more dependent on trade. They open their borders and they become more open in front of trade and financial flows as we'll see in the next two lectures. So again, I'm not just gonna, uh, this is again, it's just about growth exports and imports and it show you like uh, the composition of this. This is the, uh, uh, for advanced economies here for, for developing economies and show you again, see how China, the export growth in China, for example, or in emerging uh, uh, economies, the yellow one uh, is going. So in hard times, as I said, in difficult times, trade become an important uh, factor as well. Why? What we saw so far is just saying that how developing economies become very integrated into the world economy. This is different structure we didn't see 50 years ago. So this is something new, okay? Uh, at least very recent, okay? So that offer opportunities for developing countries, but also expose them to external shocks. So it has risks. But the this graph show you the importance of international trade or how international trade really is, it could be one important channel through which shocks will transfer from uh, uh, or will affect the whole world economy. So what we see here is two crises. Uh, the Great Depression 2019-29 and um, the, uh, the global financial crisis. So the, um, as you can see, this is the during, this is how many months after the shock, okay? So 100% is on the date. So this is uh, in June uh, 1929 and April 2008, this is 100. And then it shows you the blue line is the Great Depression and the red line is what happened during the global financial crisis, okay? So in times of shocks, in times of uh, economic troubles, trade respond to that and become one of the, the channels through which this the, the effect of these shocks transfer. So that's, that's what I meant by, yes, they become more uh, independent, they become sorry, more dependent in the world economy. So they, they, they have opportunities, and as you will see now, but also they are exposed to the risk. So that's exactly the main message, what I was trying to say. Okay, so the main message there, globalization, of course, have greater impact on smaller countries, have greater impacts on developing countries. Okay, they can benefit from trade, and obviously we saw that they did. So they do benefit from, uh, from trade. These incredible growth rates wouldn't be possible without international trade, without opening the, their borders, uh, without becoming more integrated into the world economy. So this wouldn't be possible without, without this, okay? But also in the same time, so you get benefits from trade, but also you are exposed to risk, okay? So benefits from trade include so many benefits, which we discussed now, the gains from trade and how it's important for development or for developing countries. But in general, it can be a channel through which knowledge and technology 
it's transferred okay we agreed before that you can import technology today you can have access it's open the door to the world markets you have access to products that you can produce uh, you can produce uh, uh, locally so you you can you globalization or openness or international trade give you the opportunity to have access to these okay but at the same time it makes the country more dependent on what is going on in the world economy so if we go back to the figures that we show we saw that how the u.s uh, or the, the the contribution of international trade is smaller in the u.s compared to other rich countries and also to many developing countries so if you think if you see the map again you'll see that light color uh, you see the dark blue means they are more integrated they are more dependent on international trade so the u.s as an example is this uh, dependent on international trade so the idea now going back to what we are interested in here is developing countries or poor countries um, which well which we saw in the on the map that it's dark blue they are mostly uh, dark blue in africa that means they are more integrated they are more dependent they get benefit from trade but also they are exposed to risk okay and this is mainly external shocks and uncertainties around uh, commodity prices as well so if they are dependent in oil if they're dependent in one product as you'll see um, they are exposed to this sort of risk so what I'm going to do now then uh, before I uh, jump to the theory because we need to understand how economic theory explain to us why countries trade why they become more why is it important for countries to be more open or more integrated in the world economy or more engaged with international trade so we'll see what economic theory tell us about that and then we'll see how economic theory explain the gains or the benefits from being engaged or being involved in international trade but before that we can't skip this actually we can't skip the framework or the institution that look after uh, or oversee trade in in the whole world so from 1940 after the second world war i'm sure you know that the world economy or the different uh, countries they start thinking how to institutionalize the world economy so rather than uh, getting involved in conflict and and military conflict we should have an institution that look after different aspects of the so it was the, the the birth of the united nations and other institutions like the imf and the world bank okay so the third institution which is the uh, the wto the world trade organization wasn't established at that point and that give you how difficult give you an idea how difficult trade negotiations and discussions uh, are okay and that make probably give you some hints about how difficult Brexit negotiation is because when it comes to trade it's very 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 detailed very very um, very very complicated so the world uh, or uh, countries uh, different countries or a large number of countries they start rounds of negotiations and these rounds happened under the trade negotiation which started 1947 and continued uh, of course the main aim was to reduce tariffs so to make the world more open to uh, encourage trade free trade so the w the wto was created 1995 so see how long the negotiation can, uh, started so how long uh, it lost so 19 uh, and it's still it's still going on but but it started 1947 but you couldn't establish an institution before 1995 okay and this ha um, the, the, the time between 1947 till 1995 witnessed so many uh, uh, rounds of negotiation okay but the main idea here is that again the we're trying to have an institution that uh, help people or help, help help countries sorry to reduce tariffs and make trade more uh, more open so there are some people who argue that this sort of an institutional setting benefits some countries more than others okay this is something very and we might come back to this in the tutorial uh, um, next time but just what we saw before 
we already discussed this point about uh, subsidies to agricultural products, subsidies by uh, advanced economies to their farmers. Okay, we show graphs before we show some statistics how much uh, developed countries uh, sponsor or, or, or subsidize or support their uh, farmers and that make it difficult for developing countries which mainly which depend mainly on agricultural products to compete on in in the in in the world markets so again so this is just an example of um the argument why people or some uh, people think or argue that uh this sort of settings that we have now isn't fair or isn't uh, or doesn't benefit uh, all countries uh, the same way okay so basically it's more important about who puts the rules of the game so the wto now control the rules of the game but then who control who put the rules so it's uh, it's, it's another issue so probably we'll discuss this in in more detail in the tutorial not today but what i'm interested in today is to talk about what theory tell us but before that just quickly give you the takeaway message from the first half of the lecture take 10 minute break okay I see that in your <laughs> see this in your eyes, so you're looking forward <laughs> to the break. So the main message: developing uh, countries. Or first, the we talk about the uh, two waves of globalization, and 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 we showed very clearly the second wave uh, witnessed this jump or this upward, very steep upward trend uh, of international trade. So the importance of international trade to the world economy. We saw how the fabric or the structure of the world economy is changing where developing countries now became more important more important players and they become more more open or integrated into the world economy this offer them benefits opportunities but also put them at risk okay and mainly they are exposed makes them exposed to they are more dependent on the world economy and what is happening in the world economy. So they are more exposed to external shocks or external uh, uh, crisis. Okay. Um, then when we come back, we'll talk about theory and then we'll talk about how trade is linked to economic growth. Okay. Do you have any question about the first half of the lecture? Any question? Okay. Let's take 10 minute break. I'll see you after 10 minutes and then we'll we'll talk about we'll come back to talk about international trade theory and uh, how it is linked to uh, growth. So the first half of lecture we basically trying to show that international trade is important for developing countries and they became more integrated in international trade and that means they can seize the opportunities but also they are exposed to to the risk. In this section, in, in this part of the lecture, we'll talk about what economic theory tell us, how countries gain or benefit from international trade, and also we'll look at empirical evidence that links international trade with growth. Okay? So, before we start the talking about theory, we need to answer five important questions. These are important questions about trade. Okay, which you will see how um, uh, uh, economic theory answer. So first, how does international trade affect economic growth? This is the question I asked you in the beginning. Does international trade uh, support growth? So, and how? How does trade alter the distribution of income? Does it lead to more uh, equal uh, distribution or uh, less equal distribution? This is across countries and within uh, within countries. Can trade, international trade, promote development? Can developing countries determine how much they trade? Or is an outward-looking or inward-looking trade policy best? So should we open the borders? Should we be more open or should we be uh, less open? So this is the what the theory is trying to explain or the theory is trying to answer, or any theory of trade should answer these questions. So, the classical uh, theory, or the one of the uh, most popular uh, theories which everyone uh, studies uh, international trade start with, is comparative advantage. And the main idea here is that countries 
is like individuals, okay? So they usually benefit from engaging with activities that uh, they are, um, which they are best suited. So this is what uh, comparative advantage means. So it's based on uh, abilities or resource endowment, as we see, as we will see in a, in a, in a minute. So then Cantus should specialize based on this comparative advantage, based on what they uh, are best uh, suited and this will uh, be based on differences in costs and the price of uh, cost of production and, and prices uh, of, uh, of different products. So that means the country should export. Well, if they specialize in producing what they produce most efficiently, then they should produce this and they should be able to produce it at uh, the lowest relative cost and that gives them an advantage. So this was um, proposed by David Ricardo, mainly by David Ricardo, and then uh, John Stuart Mill in, 19th, uh, in the 19th uh, century um, as a free trade model and how free trade will benefit uh, different countries. It was a static. Uh, we had only um, two countries, and, and, and we have one variable uh, factor, which is mainly uh, explained based on uh, labor costs and also complete a specialization to um, explain uh, the gains of from trade. So if we have two products, let's say uh, X and Y, and get we have two countries, each one of those countries can produce one of those products at a relatively lower cost, then those countries should specialize, so should direct all their resources to focus or to specialize on producing that only one product that they are at or they can produce at a lower, uh, relatively lower cost compared to the other country. Okay, and then based on that, both will benefit and uh, because they will be able to exchange these uh, two products uh, at lower prices and they produce them at lower cost and uh, they produce them at lower prices. And that is the that is the the main uh, point. So they. They focus the, so the, the direct oil resources in producing that uh, one product or one good that they can produce uh, most efficiently. So that means a country with a comparative advantage should be able to produce uh, this uh, the product at a lower opportunity cost than their uh, trade partners. And if, if all countries specialize on those products that they can produce at a lower opportunity cost or lowest opportunity cost, that means the world economy will benefit, so will increase the output at lower prices. So we can produce more at uh, lower prices. So that means um, everyone involved in uh, uh, international trade, all nations will gain from international trade if they follow uh, this principle or this the comparative advantage uh, uh, idea. Looking into uh, history, see if there is any evidence in, um, that this is true. There's a paper here, uh, 2004, that tried to exploit what happened in Japan's uh, trade openness uh, during the 19th uh, century. And what they did, so it was like before Japan moved from, in the 19th century, from a uh, nearly isolated and closed economy to an open economy. So they tried to compare between the prices before and after. So what we see in this graph here is the price changes of the uh, key tradable goods after opening up trade. And this is uh, net export. Here these uh, the price uh, ch uh, change. So what we see this, we see something somehow consistent, what we, we expect, we'd expect. So silk here became more uh, expensive, so higher prices. So the price increased compared to before they opened up because this is what they were good at producing at lower cost. But now they can benefit from opening their borders and selling this abroad. So they have higher demand and this will, will increase the price of silk. And compared, for example, to sugar, which they can import from abroad and at lower price. So sugar became uh, more cheaper. So all these products became more cheaper. These products 
this is where their comparative advantage uh, were at that point. Okay, so there's some sort of yes. I, if if we look at data, we might find something that can support this uh, this idea. But after that, this was developed. This model was developed uh, by two Swedish economists, Hickstra and Ulin. And they said, well, the basis of trade arises because of the uh, factor endowment. So it depends on factor endowment. It depends on uh, 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 because the availability of inputs will affect the prices and also the, the cost of production. So if you uh, have more labor, that means labor is cheaper, relatively cheaper. If you have, if a country, I'm talking of a country, if, if a nation has more capital, so that means capital is cheaper. Okay, so the uh, relative uh, factor endowment, uh, uh, relative factor uh, prices, will be different from one country to another. So, labor obviously will be relatively cheap in labor abundant countries, and based on that, the cost and the price of producing labor intensive goods will be uh, cheaper, will be less compared to other country. Okay, other countries. So that means, well, based on that, those countries with labor abundant or labor abundant countries, they should focus more, they should be specializing more in labor intensive goods. The goods that need more labor because labor is relatively cheaper, okay, compared to other countries. On the other side, countries um, that have more capital, they should produce the products or the goods that uh, use more capital, more than, because again, capital will be cheaper. So if capital is available more, that means it will be more cheaper or relatively cheaper. So that means countries will benefit from a, spe a specialization based on their factor endowment, okay? So the comparative advantage here comes from factor endowment. What is available more uh, or relatively more? So for example, capital abundant countries should produce, according to this uh, Hitcher and Lee model, they should produce uh, product that uh, depends uh, more on uh, capital intensive uh, products, such automobiles, aircraft, sophisticated electronics. And then they export these products in exchange of labor intensive goods because it's very, it's relatively more expensive in these countries, the labor, remember, they are capital abundant countries, so capital is more available, so that means capital is cheaper, relatively cheaper compared to the labor. And then in exchange, they, they import what they, um, what they don't produce, or labor uh, intensive goods, mainly like raw materials and minerals, etc. So to show this, if we, if we have, if we say we, we produce only uh, manufactured goods and ag agricultural goods, so we have like two types of, of products, so you could um, direct all resources to produce agriculture products or uh, manufacture uh, products. Like you have like a, a mix of both, so you, you're moving along this BBF line or the uh, production possibility frontier, okay? So given that using the best technology you have, you, you're using all your resources, uh, so you you be moving along this line, the BBF or the production possibility frontier. So this is for, let's say, a developing country, okay, or a less developed country. And let's treat the rest of the world as another country, okay? So, so this is the, pro uh, uh, the uh, production possibility frontier, BBF, for a developing country. So without trade, so they, close, they have closed borders, they don't have any trade, then the production and consumption will be at point A, okay? Where <coughs> this line, which denote the domestic price ratio, the price of agricultural products over uh, the price of mani manufactured products. So this line here, or this point here, would where it touch the BBF, so that means this is the best they can do. Okay, to produce and consume A. That because there's no trade. With international trade, they can remember this is developing country. Um, this is likely to be like a, um, a, a labor abundant country. This is likely to be a country that can 
uh, specialized in primary products or agricultural products. So according to this, this country should produce with international trade because now they can open their borders, they can uh, import what they need from abroad, then that means they produce at B, okay? So that means they produce more, you see, agricultural products compared to what they used to produce at A, and they produce less manufactured products because they are not really good at that or they don't have enough capital to do that, okay? So they produce B, okay? And that means if they produce B, they can consume this amount, which is obviously more than A, but still the difference between D and B is this is how much they can, they will export. Okay? So how about uh, manufacturing goods? So obviously the difference between D and C will be how much they will import. Okay, so this is different from the comparative advantage or the classical model that we show be, uh, showed before. I talked about before. So what I talked about before is like uh, you you either like you take one of these products and, and 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 specialize in this, but this one means that you still it's just the combination of how much agricultural products you produce and how much manufacturing goods you produce. Okay, so so you can you still so at B you still produce both. So if you look at B or even A, you well, A without trade, but B with trade, you still produce both products, uh, but you produce more of that one that you have a comparative advantage based on the factor endowment, you remember? So you have labor abandoned uh, country. We assume that that means they can, um, they, they are better at producing agriculture products or agriculture goods. Okay, by this, and then, they focus less on manufacture, but they still at B they still produce some manufacturing goods. Okay? And that is the that is the main idea. And that's how they gain from trade. So because if you look at how much they uh, consume and how much they uh, export and how much they import, so this is more much more than what they had before. So we can see the picture from the other side as well to the rest of the world. So we now we know that trade will uh, benefit this country, they will focus more, they will produce more, they will consume more. This graph shows exactly the same graph but for the rest of the world. Okay, so for the rest of the world, um, without trade, the equilibrium or where the point where the, um, the price ratio touch the BBF, the production possibility frontier, is A prime, this one. So this is without trade. With trade, the production, that means the world economy, remember this is A prime means that this is how much they produce from manufacturing goods and here this is how much they produce from agricultural goods. But the rest of the world is more or is better at, or the other countries is better at producing capital intensive goods, they are better at producing manufacturing goods. So what that means, that means because they produce this more efficiently, so with trade they can import what they need from agricultural goods from that developing country, but then they can focus more in producing more of manufactured goods. So that's why you'll see B prime here is more than A prime. So now that means they can produce more manufacturing goods and less agricultural goods. So that means again they will benefit by focusing more on what they uh, produce more uh, efficiently. And that means, again, so consumption will be at C prime. Again, this is beyond the production possibility frontier. And by the way, C here is beyond what you could do yourself. You remember, the this is the frontier. So without trade, you can't, there's no way you go beyond this uh, BBF. But because of trade, it actually allows you to do that. So C is actually beyond that, it's above the BBF. The similar thing here we see in the uh, world economy or the rest of the world. See here again is outside the, the frontier because again, because of specialization, because of international trade. Okay, um, and this is the BD here is how much they export and this is how much they import from agricultural products. So this is just like analytical uh, framework to just explain that both parties here or both sides will benefit from trade. So 
Developing countries would benefit from trade by focusing more on agriculture products. What the su the, 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 that's the product that they do, uh, they uh, uh, produce more efficiently because of the factor endowments. Remember, this is the main idea, factor endowments. And then the same thing happened with the world economy or the rest of the, the, rest of the world. So that was just, uh, again, the what the factor endowment tell us about uh, benefits from trade. So the conclusion here is that what we saw now telling us that trade is important for growth because we have more consumption, okay? So if I go back here, you see C prime is higher here, so it's outside the, the BBF, and this wouldn't be possible without international trade. The same thing here, C is above the uh, PBF, so they can consume more than what they could do alone without trade, okay? So again, so that means this is benefit uh, uh, consumption, uh, benefit uh, uh, or help growth because it supports or it increases consumption. It increases output because now, given that each country will focus or, or will direct their resources to the products that they produce more efficiently, that means will be will increase output. So produce more efficient, uh, produce more efficiently now, and also access to scarce resources because capital is scarce for developing countries, and then given that they focus on what they are good at, then they still, because they, they still can, um, so can access capital or other scarce resources through trade. Okay, technology is scarce or uh, uh, knowledge, etc. So again, they can import these as we explained in the beginning of the lecture. Um, just notice, did you notice this? These are the answers of the important questions. So I go back to my questions. And as I said, so the theory is trying to answer these questions. How does international trade affect economic growth? We said, again, it increases consumption, output, it gives you access to scarce resources, etc. How does it affect income distribution? How it promotes uh, development? How, uh, how much a country can, can produce? Whether to be outward looking to open or less open uh, country? And these are the answers based on this uh, comparative advantage and factor endowment uh, theory. Okay, so what we have here, so this is the, f the, the answer for the first question. Yes, it's important for growth because it increases consumption, output, and uh, open or give access to scarce resources. Also promotes equality by raising real incomes, okay, and uh, more efficient use of resources that, again, help reducing uh, uh, inequalities or promote equality. And also it helps country to develop their sectors where they have, in which they have comparative advantage. So according to this, if, you, if we have a developing country that is, uh, that it will specialize in or produce more agriculture products, agriculture goods, because they are good at this, okay? Again, the agriculture sector can be uh, developed based on exports or international trade, okay? Of course, uh, you still can, uh, because of international trade, you can import uh, technology that you don't have in your country. So farmers can benefit from this as well. So they benefit from both exports and imports. Okay, and that is what uh, international trade can. And that way, and in in, in this way, the I it helps development uh, by rewarding sectors where uh, countries have, uh, in which countries have uh, comparative advantage. Uh, how much? they can uh, trade or how much they can uh, export or import. This will be dependent on international prices and, uh, and costs. So it can be based on demand and supply, okay? Um, and of course, they should choose the mix that will maximize their uh, national welfare. Okay. And the final question, whether to be outward looking or inward looking, whether to be or more open or less open, according to this theory, what we saw now, it should be open. Of course, there are so many critics to this, okay? I'm just explaining what economic theory says, okay? So, and again, this is something that I would, I would like to discuss in detail in, in this story, okay? But in general, le just let's say briefly, this is what we have from, from theory. So these are the answers that uh, comparative advantage and factor endowment theories tell us about international trade. So international trade is important for growth. International trade help to uh, promote equality. International trade, uh, uh, reward the sectors who help development by by rewarding the sectors in which we ha uh, countries have a comparative advantage, and also 
how much countries should produce or should should uh, trade this depends on international price and cost it inter uh, depends on the markets international markets and uh, uh, because it promotes growth because of these reasons countries should be more uh, outward looking uh, or follow or uh, uh, adopt outward looking policies so they should open their borders to international trade okay and again this is the theory this is what economic theory tell us of course in reality there are so many problems with this okay and again all the issues and and, and all the uh, critiques to this theory we will we hope to i hope to discuss in the next tutorial but now this is the first point so again this is what um economic theory tell us about trade now let's turn to the uh, empirical evidence so just look into data now so forget about theory now let's look at data okay so um this uh graph shows us the growth uh of gdp and international trade so you have um annual change in real GDP per capita uh, on the horizontal axis and on the vertical axis you have the uh, annual change in uh, merchandise exports as a share of GDP. So what does this graph tell us? It tells us there's so, so some sort of positive correlation, so going that way, positive correlation between this GDP per capita growth and, and international trade. Okay, so this tell us there is some sort of positive correlation. There is some sort of association here, uh, correlation between trade and growth. So trade is good for economic growth. That's what that's this is what the graph suggests, or it is associated with more uh, with more uh, growth. So that means economic growth uh, or countries with higher GDP growth rates tend to have higher rates of growth uh, in trade. But the question here, does this association or a statistical uh, uh, correlation implies causality? So causality should be always based on, 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 on reasons, on, on, on intuition, on theoretical, on, on theory. Okay? So just having some data and plotting this data doesn't suggest any causality. Okay? So this doesn't tell us that uh, international trade or more open countries will grow faster. It doesn't say that. So it, it is not gonna cause it, it doesn't say that. It, uh, it says they are correlated. We see from what we observe, there's some sort of correlation. But people tend to think of why. So what is the intuition? So we could just discuss like one or two, okay? One is say competition, okay? When you open your borders, then you compete with the rest of the world. So those firms, that fail to adopt new technology are likely to, f uh, to close down, to shut down because of competition. And this will open the door or we direct these resources to more efficient uh, firms. Okay? So again, so competition, then that's how, uh, how, how trade uh, can um, cause or can lead to uh, economic growth. Also, economies of scale. Economies of scale, larger demand, obviously, because you now you're not producing only for your uh, 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 for your people. You you actually produce for um, including the rest of the world as well. So you, you you for exporting as well. So that means larger demand. That means operate. You can operate at larger scales, and that would lower the cost per unit. Okay, the Another reason that again can explain this intuition behind the why trade uh, can support growth or uh, boost economic growth is learning and innovation. We told about we we discussed this before. Ex being exposed to technologies, advanced technologies that you don't have in your country, but you still can import these uh <coughs> from uh, elsewhere, um, or even you can imp import the product that involves this technology, okay? So again, there are many reasons why people think there's some sort of causality, but again, as I said, this sort of uh, correlation doesn't necessarily mean causality, but some people think, well, there are good reasons here, or theoretical, or intuition, uh, that we can actually uh, say, yes, trade can boost economic growth. So, let me just finish off with uh, two papers that tried to uh, 
three papers that try to empir provide empirical evidence between international trade and uh, economic growth. This is uh, Franklin Rumor 1999, one of the most cited papers in this area. Okay, What they did, they used uh, geography as a proxy for trade. So their intuition says that if a country's distance from other countries um, is a powerful predictor of growth, given that we control for other factors as well, that means trade has causal effects. So that means there is some sort of causality. Okay, so they want to prove that there is causality, or they want to examine or test whether there is a causality or not. Okay, so uh, the country location is something very exogenous, something that you can't control. Okay, the geography you can't change. Okay, so they say if the distance is an important factor, is the distance between your this country and other countries is an is an important determinant of growth. That means trade has some sort of causal effect on on economic growth. So that was their strategy, the empirical strategy. And following this strategy, they find evidence of a strong impact of trade on economic growth. Okay. Okay. This is not the only paper that says this. So there's a large body of evidence, empirical evidence, suggests that trade is a key driver of growth and productivity. Okay. So what I what I explain here, what I Discussed here is only one paper, and I said the reason I picked that paper is again one of the uh, most cited paper in this area. There is also firm level evidence, so not just based. This is like based on uh, country data, so macro data. So the, there are also other papers that use firm level data to see whether trade increase their productivity. Okay, so. The intuition here is that if there is a causality, if trade causes or there's a causal effect um, to uh, growth, then trade liberalization, once they open their borders, that will make firms more productive. And that is, again, the intuition behind this empirical work. So this is one paper in 2002. They use this intuition and they found a positive impact on firm productivity in the import competing sector in, Ch in Chile during 1970s and 1980s. Okay? Again, what we're trying to cite here is empirical evidence that show there's a, a, a causal e effect between trade and economic growth. The paper that I'll finish with uh, against like another empirical evidence, you can find your your own evidence. This is another uh, Bloom et al. 2016, and they wanted to see the impact of um, rising Chinese import uh, competition on European firms, and this between 1996 to 20 uh, to 2007. What they found is that innovation increased more in those firms that most affected by Chinese competition, by, by Chinese imports. Okay. So that means European firms that were faced by uh, competition from Chinese uh, uh, firms, they become more uh, innovative, more productive. And this, so that there, was there were so some sort of efficiency gains, and this happened through adopting technology. So they tried to think of, uh, to find out what channels through which this effect or this uh, these gains uh, took place. So one was adopting new technologies. So they try to because they want to survive this uh, or outstand this competition. Then they have to adopt new technologies. Also increase productivity because uh, there was relocation of employment toward toward more technologically advanced firms. So as we as we discussed before, firms that fail to face this competition they are likely to shut down and that will open the door so to moving resources towards more efficient uh, 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 firms and firms that uh, use uh, uh, or technologically more more advanced okay and that is that's exactly what what they found so these are three papers that again try to show some causal effects so what we showed first was just a correlation association between growth and uh, international trade. Uh, but as I said, as I explained, 
this doesn't mean causality. This doesn't mean trade. Necessarily, this doesn't necessarily mean that trade will increase uh, or will cause economic growth. But empirical evidence or this empirical uh, research try to find evidence whether this is true or not. But as I said, uh, what we have here, f uh, this the first paper or these three papers, uh, probably like the 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 conclusion is the same. Yes, uh, trade is important or causes growth. So finally here, um, there are some people who work on this. So they say like some, some research that suggests that uh, trade helps reducing poverty in developing countries through providing jobs and access to advanced uh, technology, um, reduces prices for consumers. So that means uh, consumers will benefit from uh, cheaper uh, prices, including food which is very very important for uh, extremely poor people and also it opened the doors to, ac uh, to access uh, world markets as well so it helps reducing poverty so but there are challenges for developing countries um, and that's what makes them uh, struggle to compete in the world economy and I will finish off with this slide so basically these uh, challenges usually based on um, the settings in on those countries and also the world markets as well so the inefficient or inadequate system of transportation logistics or customs or poor connectivity into telecommunication they have uh, immature uh, financial markets or uh, information technology um, complicated regulatory environment etc that discourage, uh, discourage investment but also anti-competitive uh, behavior by major market players we explained this we talked about this before but also I as I said we would like to discuss this in in more detail in in the tutorial so just to sum up or to summarize what we what we said in this uh, in this half or even in the lecture so we started with the importance of trade yes trade uh, the developing countries became more important players. They became more involved in trade. They opened their borders to trade. They become dependent in the world economy. And so that helped them to, of course, to gain. And also they are exposed to, to, to risks. And then we move to uh, the questions or five questions to answer about trade. And we, we, we try to find out how economic theory answer those questions. Uh, <coughs> and... <coughs> we discussed comparative advantage and the factor endowment theory and how these explain the gains of from trade and the bottom line here is that all countries involved in trade will should gain or should benefit from international trade and then we uh, um, discussed a few empirical uh, evidence a few uh, few papers here we discussed three papers very briefly uh, but if you if you if you want to read them uh, please do um, so very, very briefly, these papers try to uh, show that there is a causal effect between trade and, and economic growth. So we looked at the correlation and then also the uh, caus uh, causality and empirical evidence. Uh, and that's everything we discussed uh, today. Next lecture, we will talk about international aid and, and development. Um, do you have any questions? Any questions?